everybody, it's Shelly Hoffman and I have uh, Jim Hogan. He might look familiar to you, hopefully because you saw him back in the spring talking with me and, and not because of where he actually works, right, Jim? Right. <laughs> He's hopefully not. hopefully not. He's with the Greater Baldwinsville Ambulance Corps. And I asked him to talk to me today for a couple reasons. One is to explain kind of, um, you know, what it is you guys do, you're located in the village, but it's all over. Greater Baldwinsville, like Chief Lappincheck had mentioned earlier this week. Uh, I talked a little bit about what you guys do, where your plans. We are wrap up with the um, the topic of COVID, but um, but just to kind of give people a general overview, Jim, can you kind of say what you guys uh, actually do in the ambulance corp? Sure. Um, good morning, everybody. Again, my name is Jim Hogan. I'm the director with the Greater Baldwinsville Ambulance. And first, I just want to say thank you to the community. Is um, in the past years, um, the community has been very supportive of the Greater Baldwinsville Ambulance, and this year um, it's no different. Actually, even more supportive um, since the pandemic started in the spring. Um, we've had people come in and bring drop off food, desserts, um, gift cards, um, various different um, sundries of all kinds of goodies. Um, we've had um, Baldwinsville helping Baldwinsville make masks for us, for our patients. It's just been really impressive, the support of the community. Um, so I, I wanted to start off, make sure I say thank you to everybody because um, it's much, much appreciated. And right now, the, the Greater Baldwinsville Ambulance, um, our main fund drive once a year, we do a mailer. It's a direct mail piece that goes to um, the community. And like Shelly mentioned, our name is the Greater Baldwinsville Ambulance, so obviously we cover the village, but we we cover the whole town of Lysander, the town of Van Buren, half of the town of Geddes, and the, even the the it's like the north east part of the town of Camilla, a little section of Camilla. So it's um, about almost fifty thousand people altogether. So it's, um, it's a big, big area, and we are. Um, wrapping up our fun drive. So it's a, it's a big direct mail piece that has gone out. And so we greatly appreciate any monetary donation that people can give via the fun drive, or you can donate via our website. And it's www.gbacems.org. So you can, you can um, donate that way. Um, but it, you know, again, we greatly appreciate everything. Is that the only place you get funding from, Jim? Is the community? Um, correct. Yeah. Right. So we're we're what's called a, an independent, not-for-profit organization. So we presently do not receive any tax money. Okay. So um, our main source of revenue is um, if we transport somebody to the hospital, we, we do build their insurance. Um, but as you know, a lot of people don't have insurance. Um, so uh, we we provide a lot of free care you know um but it's um it's challenging at times because um our, our stream of revenue is payment from somebody's insurance company and then we do have this major fund drive mailer but um so it's um our revenue source is we don't really have control of it a lot of times because it's um it all depends on if there's calls um if we take people to the hospital and if they have insurance <laughs> Gotcha. So I think that's important for people to know, you know, that uh, that you're not getting money from from tax dollars just because they may think, oh, they get this money. You know, they don't need my 25, 30, 50, 100, 150, whatever it is that people tend to tend to donate. So yeah. Um, yeah, that's important because um, we, you know, we don't have a marketing department, really. So we um, one of the things what EMS doesn't do a great job in is um, we don't we don't do a real good job of promoting ourselves. Um, so apologize for the, I don't know if you can hear that tone mm -hmm. going off. So um, we've had a busy morning already. Um, so, you know, and it's busy. We we average um, about 11 to 12 calls a day. It's like 4,300 calls a year. Wow. And then unfortunately, um, the last month, our volume has really kicked up because of COVID. I think yesterday and the day before we did we did 20 calls in a 24 hour period were they all covid related or were some of them other not all covid um because that's what 
that's what makes the pandemic so challenging is the um, the normal calls keep coming. You know, unfortunately, people still have heart attacks and strokes. They fall down. You know, they get injured. You know, no, all the they, they can, you know they have um, COPD, emphysema, and then you have the COVID on top. So, but there's been a we've had a lot of COVID calls. In, in November, we've had more COVID calls in the month of November than we did the whole pandemic since it started. In December, is not any different. So, are you um, getting a different age range? Is there, you know, young, middle-aged senior citizens, or is it kind of a primary? Uh, it's, um, you know, it, it's it's a little bit of everything. It's, it's mainly uh, middle-aged people and older people um, with the COVID calls, um, and then you know they they um, they get they're getting sick, and then they can't breathe. They're having chest pain. That's what I was wondering. Um, my, my son had COVID and his was just kind of a sore throat and he was tired, but um, so he never got to where he couldn't breathe. But um, you know, just been talking to people in the public and I was curious to ask you if it's really the breathing that's sending people to, um, to the hospital, like if they have an underlying condition or just in general, it's, it's affecting their lungs. Yeah. yeah, it's, um, in fact, I, I'd like to take just a little bit of time to kind of do a little educational piece Okay. Um, with the COVID. Um, because it challenged the people because people um they you know they're not sure what's going on um so if if you do get diagnosed with covid hopefully you don't um you know you you, you want to stay home and you know follow your primary care's directive um there's really good information on the new york state health department's website about if you get covid but basically you know stay home stay isolated you know, you have to be quarantined, um, and you you may have symptoms. If you have symptoms, you know, it, it runs the whole gamut. You could um, feel ill, you know, have, you know, diarrhea, vomiting, um, feel very tired. The, the key thing is um, you, you want to stay home and take care of yourself. Um, don't be, don't panic, and then, um, and you really don't want to go to the hospital unless you feel you're in trouble. Like if you're having trouble breathing or if you're having chest pain, you know, but, um, cause what's happening right now, I just, I was on a big meeting yesterday with all the ambulance directors in Onondaga County, the health department, all the um, ER staff, you know, the, the, the doctors from different chiefs of the, all the ERs. And the county is very concerned right now. The hospitals are getting overwhelmed. EMS is getting overwhelmed. Um, the hospitals are getting overwhelmed. And there's some contingency plans of what to do with them. Um, is it, the, we're, we're not even, we're not supposed to reach our peach, uh, peak, I should say, in, in Onondaga County until mid-January. Oh, wow. So it's, um, don't want to sound doom and gloom, but... Um, <laughs> Yeah, you, you want to make sure you use, you know, you call 911 and if you really need it. But um, right right now that everybody's getting overwhelmed, um, you know, EMS is um, here in the hospital EDs and um, just long waits. Um, we had a part of the meeting yesterday was how to get the ambulance out of the ER and back to Baldwinsville and back to Fayetteville. Is what's happening a lot of times is um, the crews take the patient to the hospital and we're waiting in the hallway with the patient for about one hour, two hours. Wow. And um, because um, we can't, there's an exchange of, from EMS to the hospital, but the exchange can't be made until um, the, the ER finds a, a bed in the emergency department for the patient. So we're stuck there with the patient. So that makes it really challenging because like yesterday morning, we got overwhelmed. There was too many calls for us to handle in Baldwinsville. And um, so we had, you know, we, there is a mutual aid plan where, you know, animals has come in from Clay. We even had yesterday, we had an animals come into Baldwinsville from Cayuga County. Wow. Because um, all our rigs were at the hospital and we, can't, we couldn't get out of the hospital. So, um, so, you know, never hesitate to call 911 
but you kind of want to do a self-evaluation of, um, you know, do you, do you need an ambulance? You know, is it an emergency? And if you do, call. Um, but right now, we're um, the hospitals are just very concerned. Um, you know, they're um, of what to do if if it, if it gets worse, and they expect it to get worse. Uh, are they saying January, Jim, because of the holidays? They think people are going to um, gather for the holidays, or is it just the trend in general? It's it's a little bit of both. It, as we all have seen on the news, you know, the, um, people getting together for Thanksgiving. So right now we're we're suffering from the surge of Thanksgiving get gatherings, and then there's the Christmas gatherings. So we just um, it's challenging um, because people want to get together. But um, you got to wear your mask, got to stay apart, um, and then you may want to think about your your Christmas plans because um, what our our behavior is going to affect what happens, and um, it's a direct correlation. So um, so it, it's real. It's not it's um, it's not a joke. Um, if you get COVID and you really get the symptoms, it's it's really scary for the patient because they can't breathe. Right. Yeah. And um, so we we can control it somewhat by just um, you know like everybody's heard this a million times: wear your mask, stay apart. Um, yeah. And then we um, I can't wait for the for the vaccine. You know that's. But, um, are you guys in line to be one of the first people to get the vaccine? I know that there's a kind of like an or, organization. Yeah, the, the governor just announced um, EMS is going to be in the second phase. Um, the first phase is the elderly that's in nursing homes and then the nursing home staff, which makes sense. Um, and then the first phase is um, the hospitals, like the ICU staff, you know, the wings that are taking care of COVID. And then also the the emergency department staff is um they're with the patient. The longer you're with somebody who has COVID, the, the greater the you know the greater the exposure they get, greater the odds that you can get it, even if you have PPE on. Yeah. And then we're in, we're going to be in the next phase, phase two. So when we talked back, I don't know if it was in March or April, Jim. I apologize, but you know the the protocol you guys you know you had the math sanitizing are you doing all the same steps that you were doing at the beginning of the pandemic has anything changed as far as for your department or your organization um, no pretty much i mean fortunately right now we have ppe so you know we, we've done a lot of training here and our, our staff is pretty good about it um you know we we have the n95 masks um we have eye protection and um and we have you know, if we need to see it's necessary, we, we do have to put on a gown. And then obviously we have, you know, we wear gloves all the time. But um, the challenging part for us, and I, I've had to do a lot of coaching here is, um, you know, what we just got done talking about what the health department says is, you know, stay apart from everybody. Um, don't, don't gather, you know, um, well, our crews are doing, you know, we're going into the fire. You know, yeah, we're, 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 you know, if somebody calls 911 and they have symptoms of COVID or they are positive COVID and they're in trouble, you know, um, we're, we're, you know, we got to take care of them. So we're, we're, we're directly with, right with them. And then they're, in, they're in the back of the ambulance in that little box with the patient who has COVID, um, you know, for 20 minutes to the hospital. Um, it's stressful for the crews because, um, Everybody's worried that you know they don't want to catch COVID, and, um, so it, it's a stressful time for us. I I've been a paramedic now um, for thirty years, and I, I um, you know we we we've seen all kinds of things, unfortunately, but I've never seen anything like this. Um, so, um, but you know we're doing well, we're dealing with it, but it, it's definitely stressful for the crews. Um, it's stressful for the healthcare workers in the hospital um, because, you know, people, you know, healthcare workers, uh, as you know, are catching it, and some of them are having symptoms, some of them are not. And um, and I know some colleagues in the in Onondaga County who um, who've gotten really sick with it, been in the hospital, um, 
you know, they, 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 they've made it okay, but um, and then you're missing work, um, you, you lose staff. So, um, but yeah, so we, we just need the community's help to, um, to, to wear a mask and stay apart. I don't know if you saw um, Dick Clark yesterday had mentioned about when, um, and, and I'll be honest, I didn't think about this too much in the beginning, but when someone comes into your house, whether it's an electrician, a plumber, um, the homeowner often wouldn't be wearing the mask. You know, the person coming into the home has the mask. So he's asked everybody, even when you're in your home and you're having someone come in to do work, to put the mask on. Um, and so maybe between him saying that yesterday and today, you talking about the increase in numbers, it'll it'll sink in a little bit more that uh, it's here, it's, it's in Lysander, it's in the town of Van Buren, you know, in the village. And you're seeing it firsthand where unless, um, you know, like I said, my, my son came home from college with it. That was the first I really heard about um, somebody you know, having it. I know a lot of people who are quarantining because someone they came in contact with had it. But it, but it, you know. Yeah, it's, um, you know, when you're, when the person's in their home, you know, you, they're comfortable. But um, it, we've, we've gone on many calls where, um, you know, the dispatcher from from nine one one will tell us that the patient has COVID and they're having trouble breathing. And I've gone in their house, and the person who's the patient who's having trouble breathing, who has COVID, has no mask on. Yeah. So, um, you know, right away we we have a mask and we put the mask on. Them. And um, so sometimes you you wonder how people think, but that's you know they're in their home, so they feel they don't need a mask. I, I think that's it. I, I don't think it's out of rudeness. I don't think it's out of disrespect. I just, you know, in your home, you're, you're, you think differently than when, as soon as you step out the door, you put the mask on, step out your car, you put your mask on, but in your home, you're probably not thinking about it. So it's good for people to know if you're coming or your crew, one of your crews coming and the people in the house need to put their masks on for you guys as well, for your safety. Yeah. Yeah. That's, um, that's important. You know, so, and we, we will have a mask for you, but, um, it's it, that's a good point and then we're we're doing a lot a lot of things with that um i think the public doesn't realize like the greater ball of animals like what we can do so um it's the the care is greatly advanced um you know at, at the paramedic level um a, a paramedic actually out in the field um does skills that an rn that works in the er can't do um so you know we we we're all we work independently, you know, with a, under a doctor's orders, but we have standing orders. So we have about 35 different medications that we administer for if the person's heart's not beating, you know, have an arrhythmia, and their heart's not beating correctly, either too slow, too fast. Um, all kinds of medications for people who, you know, if they're having trouble breathing, asthma, emphysema, COPD. We have cardiac again, other cardiac medicines for people who are having a heart attack. Um, start IVs, intubate people. Um, you know, we have a thirty thousand um, dollar cardiac monitor on every rig. Right. If the person's pace, the heart is, is beating too slow, we can pace electronically, um, literally pace their heart. Um, so it's um, it's like bringing the ER to you. Um, so it's um, we always like to kind of take time sometimes to kind of make the public aware of like. You know, it's it's an emergency medical services. Um, so it's you know it's quite advanced care over the years, and um, so so we've been really fortunate that GBC has kept up with the technology, and, um, it's the training and the people. So um, our community is very lucky to have this type of service. Um, you don't have to go very far where you don't have that. Yeah. So, so we're pretty proud of it. Good. Well, and that comes back to the funding that we started talking about because you probably couldn't have that equipment or the training if you weren't getting the financial support of the community. Um, right. Yeah, like a an ambulance that is empty, like like we're having an ambulance that's due next month in January. So the ambulance comes um, empty. It's one hundred and sixty thousand dollars. Wow. And then um, like a stretcher costs eighteen thousand dollars. And then we have an auto lift that will lift the stretcher up and put it into the ambulance. So, so we're trying to limit back injuries. Mm -hmm. That that costs twenty five thousand dollars for each ambulance. And then, um, like I mentioned, the 
our cardiac monitor, what's called a life pack, that does 12 lead EKGs at the cardiologist. We have one of those in each ambulance. And that device costs $35,000. So it's, um, it's, so th this is mandated by the health department. If you're if the health, New York State Health Department states that if you're going to function as a paramedic ambulance, this is the equipment you have to have. There's no, you can't say I'm not going to have it, but, uh, but the government doesn't give me any money for it. <laughs> if you had to say, um, you know, gave us the cost of the ambulance and the pieces, overall, if you just put into the ambulance the, the basic things you had to have that the, um, the government said you had to have, do you know that approximate cost, Jim, off the top of your head? Yeah. Um, so like I said, the, an empty ambulance is, a, is about $160,000. And then there's about at least another hundred thousand dollars worth of equipment inside the ambulance when you wow. count the, when you count the stretcher the lift and all the other equipment and in the involves we have five ambulances so, so in a case going back to to covid if you're um and you said you had to have somebody come and help you guys does that mean that all the ambulances were at the hospital or servicing or working yeah. with another yeah. And then that, and then we help our neighbors too. Um, like our our closest neighbor in Clay is called Nova Ambulance. Um, you know, if their rigs are all out, we go over there. Vice versa, in Camillus, vice versa, Fairmont. Um, so it, it's a mutual aid, but it just it takes longer for the ambulance to get there. Or all gone, and and then like I said, the challenging part. Um, I get frustrated as a director when I know our ambulances are stuck in the hospital and I can't get them out of the hospital. That, yeah. that's, as a director, that, that gets frustrated because um, I need them back in Beeville, but they're they're stuck in the hospital. I know. I going back again to our conversation in the spring was if you if you didn't need to go to the if you didn't need to call nine one and go to the hospital at that time it was because uh, there was a fear of getting COVID right if you. Um, that if you watch in the hospital, there's a chance you'd get, get COVID. Um, now it seems like if you don't need to go to the hospital, and obviously we want people to call 911, their heart, stroke, you know, everything that you mentioned. But, it, but if you don't, if you go to the hospital, um, I'm just thinking back to my dad when he was alive, he would be so frustrated sitting in that um, stretcher with you for one hour, two hour. I could see him getting off the stretcher and walking out if he possibly could. So it's got to be you know, even for the person going into the hospital or family members. To not get seen right away um yeah. and we it's, it's challenging for the patient because we have to explain to them because you know it's my analogy is when i if i'm on the crew and we get to the hospital we'll, sometimes you'll go into like upstate and you pull in and you'll see 10 ambulances in the parking lot mm -hmm. and, and you and you get in there and you're in a big line and, and i say it's like it's like when you're on an airplane and you're and you're you're number 10 to take off you're you know, kind of like in a holding pattern and yeah. you're taxiing and you're you're waiting to get clearance to take off or we're waiting with the patient to get for the ER to find them a room. Um, now, obviously, if the patient is having a stroke or they're having an active heart attack or there's a big trauma, you, you jump the line. Right. Well, the paramedic talks to the doctor on the radio and um, you're, you're going to jump the line. But if but if um, if somebody's really not sick, you know they triage. So um, and a lot of times we take people to the hospital that um, don't really need to go. Um, but um, then you're gonna wait. Yeah. You're gonna wait. Yeah. Oh. Oh. Well, is there anything else, Jim, that you think it's important to get out to the community? I know we, I get you off topic sometimes, so. <laughs> okay. Um, I think. Again, I really want to th thank the community for the, all their support. Um, and then I guess now in this, these times, you know, it, it, you know, if you can't breathe, you know, if you're, if you're having chest pain, I mean, don't hesitate to call 911. Never hesitate to call. Just maybe if you can think, um, do, I is it, do I really need to go to the hospital? Is this really an emergency? Um, maybe to try to contact your primary. Um, and then, and then, like I said, there's very good information on the New York State Department of Health's website about um, about COVID and COVID symptoms. 
And then the last thing that we talked about is wear your mask and stay away. Yeah. And then what's really important, um, is, and my wife's a nurse practitioner, so when she sees people come in with, with a, um, a mask on, it's really common for somebody to do this and wear their mask like this. That, yeah. that You might as well not even have a mask on. So if you're going to wear your mask, you got to tap over the nose and pinch it. But um, he says she's, and I see it too, people, run, or if you're going to Walmart or whatever, and then they wear the mask like this. Yeah. You might as well take your mask and throw it away because it doesn't work that way. <laughs> I guess I can end with that. <laughs> <laughs> I think that was a pretty good ending there, Jim. All right. I might see if I can find that to be the thumbnail for our, for our video. It'll make people stop yeah. and, and listen. So yeah. I um, well, I appreciate it. Like I said, you could hear you guys are busy. Your phone's ringing, the siren's going off. Um, so taking the time to talk to the community. but um, And then hopefully people realize that in order for you to keep doing what you're doing, we have to support you um, you know, financially so that you guys can keep, keep doing what you're doing and, and helping us and getting us to the hospital and stuff. So appreciate it. All right. Again, thank you very much. And I really appreciate the community. Thank you. Thank you, community. Sure. Bye, Jim. Bye-bye.